So if you look at the distal humerus, the front and the back, that is the anterior part of the distal humerus and the posterior view of the distal humerus. There are two epicondyles, lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle. Then you've got the capitulum, which articulates with the radial head. Then you've got the trochlea, which is like a dumbbell shaped structure. So it is something like this dumbbell shaped structure, that's trochlea which articulates with the olecranon process and the part of coronoid. Then you have got the two fossae in the front that is the coronoid fossae and the radial fossae to accommodate the tip of the coronoid and the radial head in extremes of flexion. And at the back of the humerus, you have got only single fossa, we call it as olecranon fossa that is to house the tip of the olecranon during the complete extension. On the two epicondyles, that is the medial and lateral, it is the common flexors which are attached and the common extensors which are attached. Now, why they are important? Because whenever these epicondylar or the condylar fractures happens, because of the muscle pull, it can bend, it can rotate and it can displace. The distal humerus ossification center, I will not go into much detail, but these ossification centers, their uh, numbering is usually asked in exams in MCQs especially. So you can remember the mnemonic of CRITOE, C-R-I-T-O-E and it goes in one year, three year, five year, seven, nine and eleven. So you keep adding two, two years to each. So CRITOE, C-R-I-T-O-E. And why this is important? Because when you look at these ossification center which have appeared, it helps in age estimation of the patient. The vascularity around the distal elbow, uh, distal humerus or elbow is quite important because multiple arteries, though even those this just a single artery that is the brachial artery which divides into the, the radial artery and the ulnar artery but there are multiple anastomoses which happens between these arteries and the importance of this is that if there is a brachial artery injury let's say somewhere here or here here it may not always result in a distal gangrene because of the excellent great collateral network around the elbow joint. However, once these injuries happens, the, the space here is very very tight and this can result in compartment syndrome. So fractures of the supracondylar humerus, occasionally intercondylar humerus or even the dislocations around the elbow that is the posterior dislocation could result in compartment syndrome. They may not result in a frank gangrene unless the vessels are transected and anastomosis has not opened up. But compartment syndrome is pretty common due to injuries around elbow. Three important nerves move around the elbow joint. That is the radial nerve in the front, the median nerve in the front and ulnar nerve just behind the medial epicondyle right here. Behind the groove there is an ulnar nerve. And chance of these nerves getting injured is fairly common during the injuries of the elbow. So we'll start with the distal humerus fractures. Two set of patients. One is usually high velocity injury, road traffic accident seen in younger population or younger adults. Whereas if the same fracture happens in a relatively older person, it is low velocity injury, minor falls over the tip of the elbow. It is seen in osteoporotic patients, especially women. Again, symptoms of the fractures are similar everywhere. Pain, swelling, deformity of the and difficulty in moving the elbow joint. If you look at the signs, there will be a lot of tenderness over the distal humerus. Any attempted movement, whether by the patient or you, will elicit crepitus. The three bony point relation will be altered. What is this three bony point relation? We know that in elbow there are three points, medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle and tip of olecranon. Normally, in a flexed elbow, they form a iso, uh, the scalene triangle. They form a scalene triangle. But when you extend, it, form, it goes into a straight line. So this is the normal relationship. For the normal relationship, the two epicondyles and the olecranon, so the two epicondyles and the olecranon should remain in their position. So this is in the flexion, 90 degree flexion, and this is in extension. Now, if in intercondylar fracture, the fracture line, 
So this is medial epicondyl, this is lateral epicondyl. The fracture line often runs between the condyles. So of course, this and this are going to separate out, disturbing the distance between the two epicondyles. Hence, the three bony point relationship is altered. And this is usually asked in MCQs. As we have discussed, there are vessels and nerves around the elbow. Always check the neurovascular deficit and the compartment syndrome. Investigation, plain x-ray of the elbow. AP and lateral view. Since this is a periarticular fracture and the intraarticular fracture where the fracture line runs into the joint, the geometry of this area is often very complex. So to have a better understanding, one can ask for the CT scan of the elbow where all the fracture lines can be critically viewed. The displacement of the fractures can be appreciated for the further planning. So treatment Intracondylar fractures are intraarticular fractures. Now, in general, in orthopedics, the principle of intraarticular fractures is simple. All intraarticular fractures must be accurately reduced and fixed if possible to avoid the arthritis of the joint. So, intraarticular means when the so if this is the the fracture line runs into the joint. When the fracture line runs into the joint, we call it as intraarticular fracture. And that will damage the articular surface. Hence, you have to accurately reduce to avoid the steps. If there is a step in the articular fracture, it will result in future osteoarthritis. So, all intraarticular fractures, right, from shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, ankle, or for that matter, any joint, they must be accurately reduced, fixed, and mobilize them early to avoid the stiffness.